Okay. It's fine. If it's I slacks. disappear, uh, it's Slack's fault. Welcome back. Well, we excitedly unveiled the entirety of World 1 in our last video, there were a few elements we wanted to double back on and feature a little bit further. Specifically in this video, we want to highlight the work done between our technical and concept artists to bring all the visual effects to life. Technical art encompasses a lot of unique and challenging areas in game development, including visual effects, shader development, and in addition, making sure both of those elements run optimally on a variety of different devices. It is because of this complexity that we want to take the time in today's video to break down some of these effects and reveal the process required to bring these to life. We also want to take a second to say thank you to everyone that's been subscribing and commenting on the last video. We've been blown away by the response and are equally excited to share our work as we progress through development. So let's dive in and take a closer look at this important aspect of game development and the tricks used to build out these stylized effects in Power for the Dungeon. So one of the first things I started on was the arrow visuals. So yeah, she drew up these little poofs that have uh, lines coming out of them. One of the things I tried to do with a lot of the effects here is to, instead of just draw 2D images that come out, try to recreate those forms using 3D objects. This means we don't really have to worry about the resolution of the images that we're using. It's always going to be really crisp and clean. And you can get a lot of variation in shapes by just changing the scale and rotating meshes. When you make things in 3D, there's a lot of added flexibility that you get. Whereas if you're just drawing the effect frame by frame in 2D, you don't get that kind of flexibility. Some technical benefits as well. This effect is basically just some spheres that I turn white and have little pointy trails coming out of them as well. And it kind of looks like the drawing that Shay has done. For the bounce effect, I took that same base that I created in the release effect, those little circular cloud type shapes, and just toned it back a little bit because it wasn't the initial release, it was the bounce. Once I create a base version of an effect, it can be really easy to kind of take elements of that and mix it into different effects, which I also did for the arrow break. Then I began on the arrow trail. So this started out with a lot of little sparks, which I was able to create almost from one texture, which is just a rounded line, which I can then change the scale of the width and things like that to make it look more uneven and hand-drawn. And then I can use some of Unity's trail and particle tools to create different types of lines shooting out of the arrow. And by adjusting the different parameters, I can add noise to that and have it jiggle and, and create extra layers of variation on top of it. So you kind of get the feeling that there's this powerful arrow moving through the air because there's lots of different elements of noise and sparks and trails coming off of it. So Shay had this concept of wires that had a white outline around them. One of my first techniques that I wanted to try to achieve this is what's called a Fresnel or a rim lighting style of effect. This is a shorthand for an equation that essentially takes the difference between what you are viewing and where the surface is facing. And so the more a surface is facing away from your viewing angle, the more it will change to a certain type of color. And then I'm able to basically, instead of have this be a smooth transition, just set a point where I cut that off. So it's a hard line instead of a soft rim light kind of effect. This makes it so that there's not a lot of added geometry and it's a pretty fast and easy calculation. So I thought it was gonna be a good fit for the wires. The only issue is because I needed to use the same effect on the buttons as well and the wire geometry can do all kinds of crazy things. I was trying a lot to get the normals of the surface correct. So where the computer says the different parts of the surface are facing, but it really didn't end up working for the look that we were trying to achieve for the wires. So so I ended up going a completely different direction and more or less just throwing this solution out, but I use similar techniques later. 
So the next effect that I took on was the bomb explosion. So this looked really simple in Shay's drawing, just like some different colored blobs layered on top of each other. But a lot of the time when you're trying to create things that are simple in 2D, they can end up being pretty complex once you try to recreate that same effect in 3D. The first thing I wanted to tackle was the dark blob in the background. To get it to render behind everything else, I actually did kind of a cheeky trick and just flipped the cloud inside out. So the middle of the explosion is essentially inside of a inside out sphere that is rendering behind it. I then created a special shader for it to draw a gradient from one color to another color in screen space. So it doesn't matter how the sphere is oriented, it will always do the gradient as if it's just a 2D object on the screen. Then I was able to create the little yellow clouds in the middle. And the way that I created the really hot white inside of the yellow inner explosion was to actually go back to that Fresnel technique that didn't quite work for the wires. And I actually brought it in and used it for the center of that explosion so that the edges of that middle cloud were yellow and the middle was white. It worked much better for this more controlled circular explosion than it did on the wires. So I was really happy that I was able to bring that back in here. And then you can see I was trying different types of meshes and adjusting surface normals so that everything was rendering how I wanted it to. After that, just a lot of adding those extra little bits of polish with additional sparks flying out and trying to keep playing and tweaking with the different values so that you get the timing and the sizes and everything right. That little extra bit of animation that you're doing really makes it feel more impactful if you get that timing and sizing all, all correct. So that always takes a little while to get right. Once I got the explosion made for the bomb, I was able to just make some slight color changes and add in a little screaming enemy guy flying out to create the enemy explosions. So once again, creating your one base effect, once you've got that solid, then you're able to usually just make a couple changes and use it for something else. And then after doing the explosion, I thought a good next step would be the campfire. Caitlin gave us a great concept for what a cute little campfire could look like. And I went off of this using a lot of the same techniques that I discovered while I was creating the bomb. So the outer shell of the campfire is actually inside out. And then having that Fresnel rim shading kind of technique, creating that hot middle. And then the extra little spicy bit that I put in here was a trail coming out of the top that I added some kind of wavy noise to and a nice gradient. So it looks like this nice little smoke coming out of the fire. After making all the visual effects and doing a lot of these art additions, I popped in and started testing on mobile platforms and lower end devices and noticed some performance issues. So it made me go and rework some of our shaders and rendering technology. And that resulted in me needing to talk about these changes with the artists. Because as I was changing how we were rendering things in the game, it changed how they needed to produce some of the art assets. Okay. It's fine. If it's I Slack's disappear, fault. uh it's Slack's fault. It works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys can see it? Yeah. Okay, so the first thing was we had a separate material just for double sided stuff. So double sided in general, obviously like you're rendering those polys pretty much twice, but also just the fact that we needed a separate material for so few objects messed up the batching a little bit. So I went ahead and just reduced the double-sided. So we just have the two universal materials now. We have wind and not wind. Anything that is normal, that like doesn't need any special effects or anything, just use universal render pipeline slash unlit that's gonna be like your most optimized way of doing things. All of the affected models no longer need to have two separate materials. So it'd be slightly more efficient if we re-export these to just use one material across the board. In order to kind of mimic the double-sided material, you can just take those um, parts of the mesh, uh, duplicate them and 
flip the polygon. Yeah, so so for the ones, there's only like a couple where I think it's actually noticeable that we may need to do that, like modify the mesh so that we just like duplicate it and flip it the other way. And that's probably just the animals because if you look at them from certain angles, their ears disappear now. I'll leave it to you guys to like look at the meshes that are using double-sided stuff and whether or not you want to actually like modify the geometry or leave it alone. The biggest change uh, is the new wind shader. So you'll notice that the whole tree is moving. So now I'd like to switch to doing it like where we have the wind controlled through vertex colors because vertex colors are super fast and efficient. Okay, and that's gonna like solve the problem of the wiggly windmills and like the roofs blowing in the wind also because with the mask like i remember that was a problem because it shared the same color as the trees right yeah it was like it was yellow at the top and the tree colors were yellow and we just made the entire yellow bar like wind so yeah that should fix it jess you'll have you'll have control over which models you want to have wind now rather than having been controlled by the texture color okay with it existing how it is right here like we're hitting all the performance benchmarks that we need to hit but it seems like just having the two materials is is more than enough. Hopefully digging into these effects and the steps needed to bring them to life helps shed some light on this unique aspect of game development. Sometimes this work has been described as wizardry in the industry because of the unique blend of artistic and technical skills needed from a single individual. It truly takes a special person to fulfill this role in a company. It's a special time for us when this gets implemented as we've all been playing the game for such a long time without any of these final visuals or effects. So being able to see those last tweaks get in and see the juice that they bring to the game is always an exciting step forward in the game's development. As always, we greatly appreciate all of the positive comments and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible either in the comment section or directly in the video where possible. Thanks as always, and we'll catch you in the next one.